Welcome to the No Plateau Podcast. For stroke and brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and the therapists helping them to break boundaries in their recovery journey. Hosted by Henry Hoffman, a certified occupational and clinical therapist, and Pete Duran, a certified podcast host. CPH, look it up. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Plateau Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Pete Durand, along with the wonderful Henry Hoffman. Henry, how are you today? Hello, Captain Pete. How are you? I'm doing great. We are honored to have one of the coolest names, by the way, in neurotherapy, and also one of the coolest people. Tiffany Top is on the program. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. Great to have you here. So you have your own thing going, but you're also a full-time OT, so you're a busy person. Mm -hmm. You're a West Virginia grad. I am. Go Mountaineers. We haven't talked to many Mountaineers in the program. It's good to have you on the program. And I know you sport your gear proudly. Yes. (laughs) When we did our prep call, she was in the car uh, with her Mountaineer gear. Oh, very so, nice. Uh, yeah, there's, it was, it there's was nothing solid. like West Virginia fans, I'll tell you. It's true. It is very, very true. Tiffany, I think you know in the program what we like to do is push the boundaries a bit on neurotherapy. Henry, as you know, has a, a fairly progressive viewpoint. But we're part of our journey is just to find out what folks like you who are living it every day are experiencing. Uh, things you've learned, and then things you can maybe help our listeners uh, either go explore further, whether they're a patient or a caregiver of a stroke survivor or someone with a, a traumatic brain injury, or uh, they're a therapist like you, right? That's part of the, the opportunities for them to learn from their peers. So since I'm not as smart as either of one of you, now's my time to shut up and let Henry take it from here. Oh, you're so nice, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tiffany, Pete, we're really excited to have Tiffany. Tiffany is a longtime friend that I haven't seen in a while. Um, this goes back to the Charlotte days. Uh, mm-hmm. Tiffany, we met probably at a Sable course. Actually, we went all the way back to when I lived in West Virginia, and you did a course in Morgantown, West Virginia for Health South. Ah. You and your brother. I was trained by the both of you. Well, I remember flying into Morgantown. I think that was called the International Airport, maybe, uh, which is a joke. I don't think there's going to be called the International Airport anytime soon. But I do remember uh, that plane particular because the uh, pilot, they didn't have, this was uh, post 9-11. And I was surprised to see that I had access to the pilot. There was no cockpit door. It was It was a puddle jumper. And when we landed, that pilot was also in charge of baggage claim. And he also helped me with a rental car. Isn't that kind of crazy? Gosh. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's a college town right there. And I do remember that location, the hell south there, had a big hill right in front of the hospital that goes down to the road. I forget the road. Van Borst. Yes, that was a long time ago. So yeah, we've, we've known each other for quite some time. And uh, I see you as a trailblazer, OT. And you've uh, you've done some wonderful things over the years, and I wanted to first just kind of let's get caught up. Uh, what are you currently doing uh, with the mobile therapy, as well as uh, your per diem work at the acute hospital? If you can kind of share your journey and and where are you at uh, professionally at this point? Okay, well, I've been a OT for almost twenty years now. I graduated in two thousand two, so my work background consisted of. Uh, inpatient rehabilitation, outpatient rehab, had a bunch of kids. So I did a lot of per diem work, but mostly in outpatient. And now for the past three years, I've been working mostly in the acute care setting. And just recently, uh, December of 2020, I started my own PLLC, um, Next Dimension Rehab, where I do mobile therapy. Congratulations. Was that a, uh, a tough uh, decision or were you excited and, and ready to get into that? It was scary because, you know, just learning everything that you need to know about um, billing insurances and getting an EMR system and, you know, just getting all the paperwork together to get your EIN number. And there's just a lot of technical things that you don't learn in school. 
that you have to learn on the fly. And it's helpful. Uh, I've been a part of different Facebook groups, uh, different therapists doing the same thing. So you can ask questions, you know, it's a nice supportive group of therapists that you can find online. So um, that journey has, it's been interesting, but it, it also gives me uh, a sense of, I don't know if belonging is the right word, but just being able to be my own boss and make my own decisions about right. what is best for my clients without having to check this policy or that policy or, you know, um, can we bring in this technology has been a lot f- more freeing for me as a therapist. And for the patients listening, the caregivers, as you as mm-hmm. you think about the progression of, let's use stroke survivors as an example. Yes. Uh, once they suffer a stroke, they go to, the, they, they get, their life is saved through the emergency room stroke care, right? And so they're there for right. a few days. They go to a acute ward or acute hospital, which I know you can get into in a second. And then they're there maybe for a couple of weeks and that's where they're stabilized. And mm-hmm. they're learned some basic independence and, and trying to get some strength going. And then they move on to a rehab hospital. And then after the rehab hospital stint, which may be a couple months, right? Uh, which I'd get your opinion on. You can let us know. Not that long anymore. It used to be. It used yeah. to be when I, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, length of stays could be a couple months. And now, you know, about 21 days is average. Okay. So uh, 21 days. And then, so you're in rehab hospital for 21 days. Mm-hmm. This is now traditionally for the typical stroke survivor, still within a 30 to 45 day window post-stroke. And then after that, they're discharged and they're either going to get home health mm-hmm. outpatient or maybe something like the mobile therapy that you offer. Mm-hmm. Give us, give the audience an example of what your day's like working in the acute hospital system and mm-hmm. the stark difference when you see them, because you're getting them on the front end and you're helping them on the back end too. So can you share that a little? Working at a trauma one hospital, I have gotten to work in the neuro ICU when people are just right out of surgery, whether they need an evacuation or they have something to drain the fluid or, you know, your more serious hemorrhagic strokes, you know, I've, I've been there and the biggest role I believe as a therapist, being on the the very, very front line, you're the first person that they really encounter in their journey. And education is the biggest thing. Just making sure that they understand what a stroke is and, and how it's happened and educating the family on what to expect next, because the whole rehab process can be so confusing. So that is that's the big thing. And giving them things that they can do in the room, because in acute care, you might get about on average, like maybe 25 minutes of therapy, uh, five days a week usually is about max is what what you would get in the hospital from one discipline and then another. So if you're working with, let's call her Mrs. Jones Mm -hmm. and she just gets admitted and you, and just a fresh stroke, right? And you have her probably no more than 10 therapy days on average. You know, research has changed over the years. They used to say, start very intensive early. And then there was rat models Mm -hmm. and uh, other studies that showed early intensive therapies actually could be harmful to the recovery process and the brain. So how do you balance that in in that 10 day window? Because I know a lot of it's going to happen in the rehab hospital, in the subacute. How do you balance not wanting to get started as soon as possible, balance Mm -hmm. the titrating the intensity aspect? And then what are you primarily focusing on with those patients for those 10 days while you have them in that very first hospital experience? I think it depends also on the severity of the stroke and what you're seeing. So there's a difference between someone who has complete hemiplegia and then someone who may have some shoulder going on and some hand and, you know, starting an early recovery. Um, With those people who are starting an early recovery, then you want to really emphasize the use it or lose it. You know, just whatever you can do with that arm and that hand, do. If they're completely flaccid, then we're working more on, you know, protection and positioning 
and passive range of motion and making sure that when you start getting that motor return, we're not fighting against joint stiffness. We're not fighting against soft tissue shortening, things like that. Yep. I would, I would agree um, Mm -hmm. uh, completely with that approach. The only other thing I would probably add, and this would be me being greedy, but I have to be careful with some of the research is those priming techniques. So with the flaccid Mm -hmm. folks who don't have the ability to move, is it too early to do mirror box, mental practice, um, action observation therapy, those other priming strategies that mm-hmm. are perfect for patients that are flaccid that don't have that movement yet? Some some argue, hold on to that. It doesn't have to be right away. Wait, wait a little bit longer. Let the brain heal. Let the mm-hmm. swelling go down. Um, and that's probably the right answer. But it's good to get started. Like you said, all strokes are different. Depends what stage you're at and, and the process that you have. Yeah. And, and it also depends on the cognitive ability of that patient too, you know, and the family support. So what if you have family members and a lot of times there's a family member in there all the time, all the time. And they want to know what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? So I give them as much as they want, you know, to help their loved one, because if we're only going to be in there this much and they're there all the time, then, you know, educating the family is, is very key. So to button up this First question I have, okay, that was a great example of what you're doing in the acute stage. Mm-hmm. Now contrast that with you're seeing them post rehab hospital discharge and mm-hmm. you're now Tiffany Top, the the guru of mobile therapy. What do we what's that experience like? I've had different experiences with, you know, patients when they're coming out of the hospital They've been told things like, well, you know, whatever you have after three months is pretty much what you're going to get, which is totally not true. Totally not true. And the thing that is most important is the mentality of the patient. If they can see themselves getting better, if they can see themselves moving their arm and they have the drive to get better, that is like more than half the battle. So if they're willing to work, you know, then I will give them as much as they want to work. And you're doing it in their house, right? Is this the mobile no, therapy? No, no, I go or to they, their home. Yes, you're doing, it in, you're doing it in their home. Yes. And yes. that's got to be, I mean, talk about functional and purposeful and yeah. going to what you said where, you know, they're not plateauing, they can break through micro plateaus and, and mm-hmm. neuroplasticity requires you to continue to uh, do the high reps of purposeful movement. What's right. more purposeful and functional than being in someone's home while doing therapy? Has that been, have you noticed a, uh, are they more motivated or at least are they, are they, do they have a better attitude versus being in the clinic? Have you noticed a difference in their mindset, emotional set, uh, energy level? What's the difference doing it in home versus the clinic? Well, I think a, a lot of patients, by the time they get up and they get dressed and they get in the car and then they go to the clinic, they're probably neurologically stimulated, overstimulated and tired, you know, so to be able to go to their home where they can be in comfortable clothes. One thing that I like to do is I like to set up a home program type box or or, or area or somewhere where every day you're going to do something in this box over here. So this is your special box. Is this a Tiffany box? (laughs) Not as (laughs) It's patient specific. Okay, <laughs> patient because specific. because that's that's yeah. I know you treat you treat various diagnoses from stroke to uh, yeah. lymphedema and, and Parkinson's. So you have customized home program toolboxes, mm-hmm. if you will, right. that you then set up for the client. Okay, right, right, and just really emphasizing to them, you know, telling them what the research says. You know, research says that you have to do lots and lots and lots and lots of repetitions more than you think. This is not a three, three times 10 exercise program. You know, that's not how this works. This is your new full-time job. You know, this is eight hours a day. <clears throat> what are you doing to help yourself progress through this? You know, so it's not like, oh, I didn't do my exercises today. No, there is no, I didn't do my exercises today. You have to, if, if this is your goal, if you want function, you have to do things all throughout the day in order to reach that goal. You know, Pete, this is you being in the health and wellness uh, industry for a long time and you understand behavior, especially with motivation. One of the things I used to do when working at Burke, and I don't know, Tiffany, if you've ever done this Mm -hmm. before, I used to have behavioral contracts. 
And mm-hmm. I mean, we had a waiting list at our hospital outpatient clinic. So w- we could pick and choose, you know, who, who's going to come and who's not based on who's most motivated. Because the last thing you want is a, mm-hmm. a client who is canceling, no showing, not committing to the home program. So we had a one page contract. These are the 10 mm-hmm. things they need to do. If, if they, if they initial all of them, uh, we'll continue to see them. And we're going to reassess that uh, once a month. Yeah. You know, Pete, did you, did you kind of see that with, even with client, even with clients that are not afflicted by a, an injury? Just no question about it. You know, I mean, I think in, in Tiffany to your, to what, it, as Henry was describing in a clinic, your time is valuable, mm-hmm. right? If you're giving your time to someone who's not committed, you're taking time away from someone who is. So that's why that contract's so important. So I'm curious because I, I ran a, a, up against the same thing, you know, and by the way, when I dealt with people who in, in as a trainer, their goal was to get more fit or lose some weight. And in reality, 95% of what my, my clients dealt with was 100% of their control. They could choose what to eat and they could choose what to do with their time. When you're dealing with someone who suffered a stroke or a brain injury, they've been dealt a pretty difficult hand of, you know, a pretty difficult hand. So they're, they're facing a challenge that none of my clients ever face. So their their uphill battles more, and I think their repetitions are more. I think it was more difficult to see progress mm-hmm. versus you know seeing it on the scale. Right, they could do thousands of reps and see very little movement. So I'm curious, Tiffany. I think this is where Henry was was going. Is how much of your time is spent, you know, in the emotional mindset, you know, with your patients versus the actual therapy? Is it is it somewhat balanced? Do you are you able to weave that into the therapy sessions? Describe that for us. Yeah, I think that is something that I've learned over the years how to approach patients. You really have to be a chameleon. There are some patients that really need a coach. They need you to just be upfront in their face. Look, this is what you got to do. You don't do this. This is what's going to happen. And they respond to that. And then there are others that you have to sit down and have that conversation. Okay, what is stopping you from using this device every day? You know, uh, getting down to, can we put this directly into your routine every day? Can after lunch every day, can you commit to just one thing. So if I have a patient that's not internally motivated, then I will give them one thing to do. I want you to do this one thing. And you know, um, one of the things, these, this is one of my favorite tools. If you have any flexion in your hand, uh, a flex bar is just a very easy thing to do. If sure. you ha- if you can grab it, can you take this every day, once a day, and can you just bend it for me? You know, mm-hmm. If you can't do this, then it doesn't make sense for me to give you, you know, two, three, four, and five other things to do. So we start with one thing and then we just build on top of that. Those little progressions allow them to see enough progress to to realize, hey, if I put put the effort in, it's going to work. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We talked about motivation. Um, Let's actually talk about some of the neuro stuff. Okay. I struggle with getting clients to be able to track their repetitions. And, and you brought up education early on uh, when we were discussing, and rightfully so, I think what's missing big time is when the client suffers a stroke and the family's in shock and they're going through those Erickson stages, Yeah, they're not experts in stroke recovery. They were not supposed to be experts in stroke recovery. When I have a problem with my car, I go to a mechanic because they're the expert. I don't know what's going on. Some people are wonderful with cars. That's just not me. So just like, just like these individuals. And a lot of times they don't get a good explanation. And it does take someone that's going to sit down for the extra minute or two, mm-hmm. be encouraging, you know, because it's so hard. You know, it's very easy for us to de- get desensitized because we're seeing so many patients on a weekly basis. So we lose some of that bedside manner. So to have that proper bedside manner, continue to be empathetic and encouraging and take the time to walk them through the recovery process. Here's what's going to happen to you over the next 90 to 120 days. This is what's probably going to take place. And this is step one. And step one is you need to start to use and engage your affected side. And here's what we're going to do to engage the affected side. Now, when they get to the subacute stage, when the brain healed up, 
Um, it's safe to do intense therapy. And we're now looking for hundreds of repetitions. I think that's the disconnect at that point. We do a great job, some of us, explaining that we have to have these patients do hundreds of repetitions. But how are the patients being held accountable for that? They don't have sensor devices to track every rep. Remember, there's mental reps like mirror box and mental practice, action observation therapy. And, and for the folks that are not familiar with action observation therapy, that's when you actually observe another patient doing exercise. So if, if two patients are in the room mm -hmm. and one patient is watching the other patient doing a functional task with their affected limb, just by watching, research has showed that the brain lights up in the observer uh, cortex, same area as if they were physically doing that task. So good news for lazy people, right? Like myself, but we already know that. How many times have we watched Tiger Woods golf swing if we're trying to be a better golfer? Yeah. Observation therapy actually works and it's, 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 it's a proven technique. So mirror box, observation therapy, mental practice, those are a lot of reps that you can do without even lifting your finger. So, and then you have your physical reps. And if we're trying to get to 300, 400, 500, 600 reps a day, how are we really tracking that? So some people use clickers. I've told patients, let's, let's figure out and calibrate how many times you do a rep in five minutes, and then we'll just multiply. So then we'll know every time you do this for 20 minutes, that's how many reps it should be. And then check it off. Have you done anything or learned a trick that we need to know about to help your, uh, us and others communicate better to patients about the best way to track reps and make sure they're held accountable for that? Well, one thing that I thought about when you were talking was when I was working in the outpatient clinic, I formed a group called the Upper Extremity Recovery Group. And it was for patients who had limited visits, like some of these private insurances, they give you 20 visits total and that's it. Or uh, somebody who may not have insurance. It wasn't for Medicare patients because they they get a lot. Right. One of the benefits that I saw of this, and, there, and, and we could fit about um, six patients in the, in the clinic. And it was, it was from like five to six on a Thursday or something, something like that. And they would just pay like, I think it was $40 a month. So it was like $10 a week pretty sure. much to, to come. And they would have, I had a, a tech and I had a volunteer and I had myself. So it wasn't one-on-one -on -one therapy, but it, I, what I did was I set up different stations in the clinic. And one of the things that I noticed is how much they were encouraging them themselves. You know, if somebody's struggling to pick something up and they would say, Hey, you know, I used to be like that, but if you just keep going, you will get better. It sounds different coming from somebody that knows exactly what they're going through than a therapist that doesn't exactly know how they're, what they're going through. So I never really thought about how they're them watching each other could actually be a neurological benefit. Oh yeah, absolutely. Tiffany, let me ask a follow-up question because that's very important, mm -hmm. right? In, in, in today's, well, here we are, we're on, we're on a, a call and we're sitting in three different parts of North Carolina, I believe in South Carolina, right? So we've got the Southeast well represented. If there were three or four people who were in post outpatient care at home sitting on a call like this, mm -hmm. would they be able to inspire each other the same way virtually as they would be if they were in the room, you know, four feet from each other? Do you think that peer motivation would be helpful? Do you think that's a service people would crave? Henry and I are, we're always trying to figure out how, because we have, we, we, we treat people all over the world, mm -hmm. which means Henry can't be everywhere. You can't be everywhere. So how do we reach people with technology mm -hmm. when this is a very tactile thing? Do you think it's possible? I think so. I think so, because I, I'm also a part of different stroke support groups online okay. and people are constantly asking questions. What did you do for this? And what did you do for that? Or they'll post a video of themselves walking or they'll post a video of, look, my hand open today, you know, to have an actual small support group that you could bounce ideas and have some, somebody kind of mediating things. Okay. I think patients would really enjoy that. So that moderation would be relevant. Yeah. Having someone who can mod. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Henry, any follow-up questions on that? Not so much on the remote 
therapy, I do agree. Um, that can definitely be helpful. And I think the big limitation with uh, group therapy with neurological clients versus, let's say, people at the gym is everyone has their own limitations, whether it's aphasia in a wheelchair or someone with high level or maybe someone with cognitive issues. So you'd really have to kind of organize the groups where they're tailored to be with individuals with suffering the same limitations. And I think then it could really do well. Tiffany, you were mentioning uh, earlier before the call uh, that you also do some lymphedema. I was hoping yes. you could spend a few minutes explaining to the audience what the heck is that and and what special training do you have and, and mm -hmm. do individuals with stroke also have lymphedema? April of last year, I got my CLT certification. It's a 10 week intensive, 135 hour. That's a lot of hours. Yes. Yes. So uh, I think it was 10 days, nine hour days for 10 days sh straight. Wow. No break. Yeah. Very intensive. I see a lot of swelling. Anytime you have a dependent limb, you're going to have some type of swelling. And one of the things that I learned in the lymphic edema course or that reinforced what I was already doing is the use of kinesio tape, you know, kinesio tape for facilitation, but also kinesio tape to help with swelling. And just explain what kinesio tape is. So kinesio tape is like an, it's an elastic tape you may see that type of tape on Olympic athletes, you know, during the Olympics, you see their, their shoulders might be taped up, you know, their knees may have some tape on it. So, Basically, depending on where you place it, how you place it, what direction of pull, you can actually use kinesio tape to facilitate finger extension. Um, you can facilitate dorsiflexion, you know, um, but you, I see swollen hands a lot, especially when they don't have a lot of movement and putting that kinesio tape on there. The next time I see them in a couple days, the swelling is almost totally gone. So, I mean, it really is a, a great tool. Yeah, it's amazing. I've, I've used that uh, for pain as well as swelling. Mm -hmm. It is neat to see. So with your lymphedema patients, uh, besides the hand, where do they typically have the biggest issues? Is it in the shoulder? Is it the elbow? Is it the leg? Where are you usually treating them? My most complicated lymphedema patients are the lower extremity ones. So the more swelling that you keep in your legs, the worse your skin will tend to get over time. So that swelling gets thicker, the more that it stays in there. And then you have skin changes that happen and that increases your risk for cellulitis and skin infections and, and things like that. And so, so what do you typically do for those lower extremity ones? What do you recommend for anyone listening who may have some swelling in their ankle or leg mm -hmm. and say, gee, I might have this issue. What would you typically prescribe for that individual or what would you do? The whole thing about lymphedema is called complete decongestive therapy. And that consists of three things. So one is skincare. So making sure that any type of swelling that you have for any reason, when the skin is stretched, it's more likely to get micro fissures in it. And where you have little uh, cuts in your skin, you're at risk of infection. So skincare is number one, making sure the skin is washed and cleaned every day and lotioned. The drier the skin, the more likely you have the cracks. So you want to protect the skin. And then number two is the um, compression. So we use, we don't use ACE wraps because ACE wraps stretch way too much. We use short stretch bandages that have just a little bit of stretch. And that's, that's what we learned to do as a, uh, as a lymphedema therapist. So we do a bandaging technique. The pressure on the limb allows like an osmosis effect to the body to reabsorb that fluid through the lymph system. And then the last thing is, is maintenance. So once we can get the limb down and the swelling out, what do we do to maintain that? That's where there's a, a lot of um, grief for the, uh, for the lymphedema therapist because insurances don't pay for compression garments. Isn't that unbelievable? It just drives me crazy. And they're not cheap. They are not cheap. I think about the, reimbursement problems that we have mm -hmm. in general, what's covered in therapy and what's not covered. And it's, it's very unfortunate for stroke survivors and other diagnoses that they have to pay out of pocket for a lot of these things that should be considered medically uh, necessary. Right. 
Tiffany, the last question I have is, again, our audience is going to be primarily uh, stroke survivors. So I wanted to end on a stroke survivor topic. You've been doing neuro rehab for a long time too. And yes. where do you think stroke rehab is going and where will it be, let's say five, 10 years, 15 years from now, from your perspective, mm -hmm. from a technology perspective, from a outcome perspective, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, being in the health field for probably the last 20 years, I've seen the trend of what health health insurance is covering. And I've seen the length of stays shorten. And what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing this migration of therapists that are getting frustrated and they're doing what I'm doing. They're going outside of the typical corporate healthcare America and finding patients that just want that one-on-one -on -one with a therapist to help them get better. So I see stroke rehab going in a way that Patients are going to be more educated. They're going to have more choices. So right now, you know, the choices are okay. So you can go to rehab, you can go to outpatient and home health and, you know, and then that's it. So I would like to see more gyms and more community centers really centered around getting equipment in that is accessible, not just to patients with disabilities, but uh, patients who are geriatric and patients who are bariatric. And that, that's a big population uh, that, you know, you don't want to go to a gym if you are disabled with other able-bodied people to, to look at you like, why are you here? And, and a lot of times in, when I worked in um, an outpatient, what we would do is, okay, you know, your insurance benefits are up. You know, we want you to continue with the home program and we would suggest that they go to a gym, but that's not always the safest for these, these types of patients. So I would like to see more centers coming open. I'm seeing a migration of exercise physiologists actually coming on board side by side with therapy and you know, getting an exercise prescription from the therapist and then a cheaper route of being able to do more with not just therapists, but other disciplines. Well, you bring up something that's um, near and dear to my heart for, for the future as well. I have a lot of contacts, uh, and this was pre-COVID, where uh, the goal was to start working with gym operators to see if there's mm -hmm. way, ways to get more access to neuro clients. Because it's amazing how many patients I've worked with, a lot of them do go to gyms and a lot of them do have trainers, which is good. A lot of them don't. To your point, we need more. Even though we're licensed occupational therapists, I got to tell you, a lot of patients get more motivated around a trainer and I'm, um, I'm now promoting and propping up Pete than OTs. Um, sometimes OTs and PTs, they're, they're set in their ways and, and they don't have that personality as a go-getter and a motivator as a life coach, as trainers. I always tell my patients, look, don't save your money. For half the price, you can get a wonderful trainer coming to your house three times per week, or maybe they can help you at the gym. So I'm 100% on board with improving that access. And I think that's going to be uh, uh, very important in the future. So that's a good observation. And, and definitely, Pete, let's add in the show notes, Tiffany's contact details. If patients listening happen to be anywhere near Charlotte, they'd be lucky to have Tiffany as a therapist. So neck of the woods, definitely look her up. But thank you, Tiffany, on that um, conversation. And, and I, know, I know one of the things that as an OT, I, I was told I had to be an advocate for my profession when I was in school, but I didn't realize how much of an advocate I really needed to be, especially when it comes to evidence-based practice and things that I know personally work and research shows that work. So, you know, for, for one thing, the mobile arm support, I had to advocate for two years in order mm. to get that piece of equipment into the clinic. Yeah. So it, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of endurance to really fight for something. Because like I said, it's, it's just so um, lower extremity oriented in the clinic. Right. You know, you got bikes, you got the new steps, you got, you know, all these things from lower extremity. It's like, 
<laughs> if you can't lift the weight of your arm, what's a TheraBand going to do? And what's a hand weight going to do if you can't hold on to it? You know, you need more things in the clinic that a patient can use on their arm and be able to do all those repetitions because one or two with just lifting the weight of their arm and they're done. Right. Pete, if you ever, uh, next time you go into a hospital and you'll walk down the hall and you're wondering where the PT or the OT gym is, it's extremely obvious. When you go to the endless square footage space, that's the PT gym. And then when you go to the closet on the right, that's typically the OT gym. Hopefully that does change. And my other gripe uh, as a OT is when hospitals have no problem cutting checks for these fancy robots because it brings in business. Most of the evidence, the most beneficial evidence-based practice strategies are pretty darn cheap and they don't need to be robotic. So, and Tiffany, are you going to have a robot in the home with, with uh, at your client's house? No. So I do wonder no. and question some of the decision-making at the hospital level, but Pete, go ahead. Well, Tiffany, there's a reason you're on the program and, and that's because we're looking for people who aren't going to settle for the norm. Right. Right. Who are going to advocate not only for the patients in their clinic, but advocate for the, the people that have left and are now trying to, to tackle this at home. And, and I think one of the things we're trying to do with this program is connect those people who are at home. As you described earlier in the program, you know, somebody may have already written them off. Mm-hmm. It's not the case. Uh, and, and as Henry described, there are very simple things they can do. They just need to understand that they're there, how to do them. And sometimes I think the biggest thing that I understand is just checking off that they did it that day is enough of a win. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean I can lift more, do more. Just the fact that I did my reps is the win for the day. So um, I, I'm so grateful you spent some time with us today. And as Henry described, if I was in Charlotte, I'd come to see you anyhow, no matter <laughs> what I was doing. Um, but uh, thanks for being on the program, Henry. Thanks as always. And that's another episode of the No Plateau Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the No Plateau Podcast. Please make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on more stroke and brain injury recovery stories. The No Plateau Podcast is intended to give you an insight into stroke and brain injury survivors' journeys. Any opinions given on this podcast are strictly the individual's, and we do not suggest that you necessarily hold the same viewpoints as anyone on this podcast. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Reliance on any information provided by the No Plateau podcast is solely at your own risk.